Hi, everybody. Welcome to this panel conversation today, asking where are the working class journalists? Uh, before we begin, I'm just going to run through what this panel conversation is going to be all about and introduce the panelists here. Um, working class representation in the UK journalism has hit a record low. A report released in 2022 found a staggering 80% of journalists come from professional and upper class backgrounds. And while gender and race representation has improved in recent years, social class was one of the few areas where the UK news industry is getting increasingly unequal over time. We are here today to talk about um, why any of this matters, why make journalism an industry less dominated by the well-connected and wealthy. Does it impact the quality of journalism and is it going to change? I'm here with uh, three excellent panelists today. Uh, Victoria Sanusi, a freelancer and host of Black Gals Living podcast. Uh, Robin Vinter, the North of England correspondent for The Guardian. And Jane Bradley, the UK correspondent for The New York Times. Um, just a few things I want to note before we begin this conversation. Um, uh, so first of all, you can of course grow out of being quote working class, um, but it's really important that your set of experiences and understanding of the way that you understand the world stays with you when you are from that background, which is what we're exploring today. But we'll also discuss people currently still considered working class uh, and whether they're able to financially sustain themselves in this industry. There's also the point to make about the ever-changing conversation about what is working class, uh, whether it's best to label it low income. Uh, we're not here to define and talk about the labels uh, and the factors involved of how you define working class, whether that's you receive free school lunches, what job your parents had, do you have money to fall back on. But in short, we're talking about people that do not come from these wealthy, well-connected backgrounds. And then finally, of course, we are all in the UK, based in the UK, um, and it's what we know. Uh, and frankly, it makes British people quite uncomfortable to scrutinise and ask these questions. But we are very keen to also explore what it is about the UK, whether it's unique in this position, or whether in the Q&A people want to share their experiences of where they live and whether the same conversation around class is happening. Um, before we begin, I just want to ask the panellists to briefly talk a little bit about how they got into journalism um, and a bit about their background as well. So, um, Robin, could you kick us off? Can you hear me okay? Should I be close? Maybe I'll be closer to the mic, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I uh, am working class, grew up um, in a uh, working class family, um, went to the sixth worst university in the UK <laughs> um, at the time, Leeds, Leeds Met, which is now called Leeds Beckett, um, studying journalism, and uh, ended up getting a job uh, on a farming magazine called Farmers Weekly, uh, out, out of um, <coughs> out of uh, university, um, and then from then I've kind of moved around a little bit um, and kind of done other jobs, um, mostly kind of business reporting, um, and then I, I became kind of like a, a general news reporter, and now I am North of England correspondent at the Guardian, um, which is a kind of gem general news reporting role. It's um, kind of reporting so covering the whole of the north of England uh, which is quite a quite a lot of people actually it turns out <laughs> um, and um, yeah I think I think that's probably a, a good quick summary I can beat your university story so um, I'm from Hull which has famously voted the worst place to live in the UK <laughs> several times we're consistently in the top 10 but it's been a while since we were number one um, so yeah, I'd also consider that I'm from a working class background. Um, my, I didn't know any journalists. Um, when I told uh, some family members I wanted to be a journalist, they were like, okay, cool, like you said you want to be an actor, like, but what's, what are you really going to do? What's your backup plan? Um, so I actually got into journalism through the BBC trainee scheme, um, which at the time was trying to diversify and kind of get people who weren't just from an Oxbridge background. So I very much fit the bill there. Um, so I'd gone to uni, but I actually got offered this traineeship at the BBC when I was 20. So I dropped out of my degree, much to my parents' horror, um, and took a chance on this year-long trainee scheme and thankfully managed to just about keep employed since then. And that was about 15 years ago. Um, and yeah, I started off at local news at the BBC, kind of worked my way up to investigations. I just kept pitching, pitching stuff. Um, 
and eventually ended up working at BBC Panorama as a producer there before leaving to go freelance wet at BuzzFeed News on their investigations team, RIP. Um, a lot of great journalists out of jobs now, by the way, if anyone is hiring, I'm not important enough for that. But um, yeah, and then joined the New York Times about three years ago as its first um, UK investigative reporter, and that's the job I do now. Is it working? Hello? Do you want to use mine? Oh, it is. Okay, cool. <laughs> hey, everyone. I'm Vic, and I am a journalist. I started when I was... Oh, um, so basically, I went to Brunel University, and then my lecturer said to me, you won't make money. She was like, you're going to make 15 grand. And I was like, damn, that's nothing. Like, <laughs> I'm not gonna, I'm, How am I going to buy clothes? How am I going to go to Zara? So anyways, um, so I remember saying to her, I'm dropping out today. I'm dropping out today, because how am I going to tell my parents I'm making 15 grand? Like, they're just not going to understand. We, you know, I'm from a Nigerian background. Um, grew up working class, uh, grew up in Plasto in a very, very rough area. And um, yeah, so, but then she was like, do you know what, if you work really, really hard and you think differently to everyone else and you use your background to your advantage, you will succeed. And I think that's probably why um, things worked out the way they did for me. So um, during university, I um, would pitch the local newspaper and I was the only person doing it and everyone thought it was really uncool. And it did seem quite uncool at the time, but I had all these bylines and I was like sneaking into like the politics team whenever like a politician would come in, uh, get quotes and stuff like that. And then um, what, what happened next? Then I did loads of on free, um, unpaid internships. That was hor horrible whilst working um, my part-time job. And when I look back, I just feel like that is just such a horrible thing to experience, like working nine to five and then going back to Essex where I lived with my parents and then going to work for New Look. And it's just like, it's so tiring. It was so insane. And I remember telling my, um, my uh, university um, classmate and she was like, why are you doing that? And I was like, because I have to like, how do, you, how do you not do that? It was crazy. I think that was like the real realization that not everyone has the same experience. And then I worked at BuzzFeed where I met uh, Jane and Roz and they're amazing. Um, and I did a, a fellowship there and it was really, really great and had a bunch of experience there. And I was kind of like in this weird, unique position where I was like, if they don't keep me on, I have loads of bylines. I have, because it was a very, very interesting um, fellowship because um, I wasn't just there to like make tea and coffee. I was just there to actually write and just do what I wanted to do, which was very interesting. So I left with like 100 articles, I think, at the time. So I knew if I was going to go anywhere else, if they didn't keep me, I'd be okay. But they did. And, um, but I left. <laughs> Love. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and then I've worked at The Eye, I've worked at um, Stylist and Bustle, and now I'm freelance. Great, thank you guys. So you touched on this a little bit about um, what you just mentioned, Vic, about unpaid internships being what's, you know, somewhat of basically an immediate first barrier for a lot of people that don't come for money trying to enter this industry, um, as well as you know, the relatively low paid entry level jobs that come with journalism. Um, and then on top of that, we're thinking about if you were to do a postgrad at City or Columbia, you know, some of these fees start at what, 10 grand a year. Mm -hmm. Did any of you, what were your experiences with these unpaid internships? I know you touched on that briefly. Did any of you ever consider doing a postgrad? What were your thoughts when you were entering journalism? Like, right, what do I need to be doing here to break into this industry? Again, again, the Zara, wanting to shop at Zara. <laughs> I felt like if I was going to do a postgrad, that's more money. And I just felt like, oh, it's just, I, and I didn't even know how to break it to my parents. Like, oh, I think I need extra money. Um, oh this thing wrong. Hopefully this is all right. Um, so yeah, I just had to really be as creative as possible and find other routes. So the unpaid internships were what I used to my advantage, which it sounds weird to say you're using unpaid internships to your advantage. I would say, if a journalist asked me not to do that, I'd be like, please don't do that because it's just so unfair and there's other ways to get bylines um, by, by pitching and not saying that you're a student journalist or saying you're a journalist with no experience. Just be confident and pitch your article. Um, but yeah, I think that was literally my experience and my experience doing unpaid internships at the time was absolutely horrible and you were treated like poo you know they would be so rude to you some editors and they wouldn't look at you in the face and um there was one time no, let me, um <laughs> there was just some horrible stories and i see these people like i see them because like i'm a grown-up now and you know it's just it's so it's just i don't know i don't know how people i don't i, I think it's, it's interesting because you meet really great journalists and they make you think oh do you know what? this profession is not that bad like these people on the panel um but yeah i think things are changing a little bit. Yeah, 
I've also had um, uh, my shitty experience with unpaid internships. Part of my thinking when I was when I was 18 and trying to decide whether I wanted to go to uni at all or whether I wanted to go down a more practical route, I'd basically used up every kind of unpaid work experience in my small town of Hull by the time I was 18. Like I'd worked for I'd worked for uh, the Hull Daily Mail for free. I'd worked for Look North for free. I'd done freelance music magazines just to get into gigs. Um, and there was really nothing else for me to do. So I thought, right, you know what? I'm going to take, I'm going to do this degree in London because worse comes to worse. I'm going to be able to do some uh, unpaid work experience with the backing of a student loan. And without that, there's just no way I would have been able to uh, have the money, even with all kind of the crappy jobs I was working, to travel down to London and back to Hull every day to get the work experience I needed to kind of get the job I wanted. So um, I went to uni, I used a student loan um, to kind of basically it covered my uh, accommodation and that was it. Um, I worked two bar jobs at the same time, which again, my friends were like, why are you going to work? Why don't you come out with us? I'm like, because I need food. <laughs> um, and I got this unpaid internship at a company I won't mention, but I worked there unpaid for three months. But there were people who were working there unpaid for a year. Um, and that was really my first experience of the class barrier, really, um, in that. So this, this company, it was just, in, in fact, its job, its focus was diversity, ironically. Um, and there we were, all unpaid. Um, but it was mostly writing up um, secondary news articles. But... Uh, I found out from another intern that the boss had said, um, oh, don't let Jane do the phones. I don't want her accent representing the company. <laughs> um, and my accent was a lot stronger than it is now. The vowels were really out. Um, <laughs> but, and I was like, why? Like, I'm good on the phone. I'm good at talking to people. Why does it, he want me on the phone? Um, because I said things like phone. Um, and uh, that was really when it hit home that, okay, my accent and where I'm from is going to make things really difficult, even in this kind of unpaid world. Um, and yet, that continued throughout the career, throughout my career, really. But in the unpaid uh, work experience, I think people were probably just a bit more honest um, about it. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting actually hearing that because I've had, I had kind of a very similar experience to you guys. I, um, I can remember when I, so during the kind of the holidays at university. Um, I well during the whole time I worked at university, I went to this. I did this awful cinema job um, that was just like scooping popcorn and like you know scraping it out of the carpets when people had left the film, and um, and I hated it. It was really badly paid, um, and but I had but I had to do it. Um, and some of some of the other students didn't have jobs because they were supported by their parents, um, and I can remember. Uh, so I, I used to work full time during the holidays um, because. Yeah, I needed to buy food. Um, and I remember having to take holiday from that part-time job, like over the summer, to do work experience, you know, a week here or two weeks or something like that. And I can remember, uh, I think it was after my second year, so going into my third year, um, going back to university university in, the, in September and being exhausted after the summer because I hadn't had a break and, you know, I'd been, I'd been working late nights, like sometimes we'd finish at 2, 2 a.m. Um, and then, you know, having to do, uh, you know, my university work and then trying to do work experience. Um, and I was, I was, I didn't really enjoy university at all for that reason, really, especially because I was quite ambitious and I wanted to do, I wanted to get a good job in journalism um, and I wanted to do well in my degree. Um, and I felt one, one thing that I had such anxiety about at the time was that I didn't get involved in the student media, I didn't get involved in the student paper, uh, because I, I just didn't have time, like there wasn't, you know, I maybe wrote a couple of articles for them, but I just didn't have time. And I noticed that now working in journalism, a lot of people, uh, you know, a lot of my colleagues and, and friends got, got a start in in, in their career mm. by doing student media and being able to say, look at all these front page stories I had for my student paper. Um, mm. And they did, all, they did all that because they were being, you know, in most cases anyway, because they were being supported um, by, financially by their parents and they, they didn't have to have a part-time job. Mm. Um, and it, I think that's, it's really kind of striking and noticeable how many people that applies to. Um, mm. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think you all touched on the difficulty there from a financial, financial point of view, but also, as you say, time mm -hmm. and energy when you are trying to break into that industry. And something else uh, I sort of briefly touched on was thinking about the school and the university that you attend. I know that you guys joked about where your rankings for your university was, but did you find that when you entered the industry or were trying to enter the industry, where you went to university, whether you felt like you came across people that had attended a lot of private schools and what your sort of interactions in those sort of early days, what they were like? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, um, when I think you can just press it. Oh, just press it. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I, th I think that was the biggest culture shock of my life. Like, obviously, I'm black and like, I've experienced life as a black woman, so it's like racism is not new to me, etc. But re um, class is that was the most shocking thing. I mean, not shocking as racism, duh, but like, you know, you enter a workplace and everyone has gone to Cambridge. And cool, you go to Cambridge, but it's like everyone knows each other from day. Like they will, they will cite things like, yeah, when this happened, or they'll talk about a cultural event, and you're thinking, what the hell? Like. I will talk to Ross sometimes, and I'll be like, are they talking a different language to me? Like, <laughs> I'll be freaking out, I'll be like, they're saying different words, or they, they have these nicknames, and all these things. Like, I felt like, I felt like I was in the crown, but like, I felt like I was an outsider. It was just, it was such a strange experience. Um, anyways, um, but what I did find was, when I got my first job, my boss at the time said to me that, yeah, literally everyone who applied for your job was from Cambridge, but you stood out because you have more experience. Like you have, you know, you're involved the student media, you uh, wrote for the local press, and you've done all these unpaid internships. Um, whereas everyone else just has, you know, their university on their, on their thing, which is, you know, you go to a top uni, that's great, but like what else do you have experience to show? Um, so I found that really, really interesting, but interesting because it's like, if he doesn't think the way he thought, then he wouldn't have taken a chance on me. And someone else would have just thought, let's just go with someone who is seen as the best. So, yeah, I thought that was interesting. I think that positive point is really interesting because when I joined the BBC, um, similar story, like there was basically kind of a feeder from City University, Oxbridge directly kind of into B the BBC newsroom I was in at the time. And um, yeah, it was, uh, you just felt like a massive outsider, you didn't get the language, you didn't have that network there. But when we joined the trainee scheme, um, you kind of got a mentor. Um, everyone was assigned, or the, or the mentor picked you, and it was a massive help when you're starting out. And um, we had, um, we had like a, uh, when, when you first joined, there was like some drinks thing where everyone met everyone, and you're meant to like write up a bio of who you are, and it, um, goes out to kind of all the editors and stuff there. Now, I like, when I got the email requesting this, it was like midnight, I got back from my bar job, like they wanted it the next day, I wasn't really thinking, so they were like, oh, just send us a bit about yourself. So I thought, oh, this is just like an informal thing. And I wrote my bio, like, hi, I'm Jane, I love the news and talking to people, and I love a pint of snake bite, I work at the bar. <laughs> um, and then I got there at the, at the welcome drinks the next day, and. It, and all of the buyers were like printed out in this like laminated booklet where everyone else had described themselves in like third person and talked about the Latin they did at Oxbridge. And I was there like trying to hide like my bio and pull it out. But what it did was there was an editor there who also was from a working class background. He was from Hartlepool. He also didn't have a degree. And he was honestly the best mentor. He, worked, he was an editor in the... Um, New York bureau and everyone wanted him as the editor because everyone wanted a week in New York and he picked me because of the similar background we had and that I was different from um, you know a lot of the other trainees who were on that scheme so I think it's definitely hard when you go into newsroom and you know everyone's from the same posh schools the same unis but if you can find a mentor or kind of allies who is from a similar background and gets it that can really help you. Yeah, it's interesting, actually, at the, at the start of my career, I didn't really notice it that much. Um, and I think it was because I, the first kind of two or three jobs I did were, like, not very prestigious publications. Um, so, you know, people didn't quite have a similar background to me, but they, but they hadn't necessarily been to Oxford or, or I don't know, um, been privately educated. In some cases, that was true. But, um, and I... Uh, so it wasn't, it, it kind of wasn't really that striking at first. Um, and I think, I, I remember feeling, I used to feel so jealous when I first started that I was working at Farmer's Weekly magazine um, and I'd see people 
you know, like people my age who had the same amount of experience as me working at like, I don't know, uh, the Financial Times or something, like doing the stuff that I really wanted to do, but just like hadn't had the connection to like get, get in there somehow. Um, and I remember it, even, even at that, that job at Farmers Weekly, um, I remember they were hiring another reporter and I remembered a guy from uni who was really good who hadn't got a journalism job. And I was like, oh, you should apply for this job. So he applied for it. Um, and I asked the editor who was hiring um, the person, I was like, oh, did you get the CV from my friend? And he was like, oh, no, um, the, the H HR must have filtered it out um, because he'd gone to, he hadn't gone to a good university. So before it had even got in front of the editor, and, he, and actually he ended up getting the job and he did really well. Now he's the editor of that publication. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. but, you know, if I hadn't asked that question, he would have, you know, that editor would have never even seen his CV and he would have, and he would have just been filtered out. Um, and, and that was just purely, I think, purely based on the university that he went to. Um, and obviously now I work for a more prestigious um, publication, and it's definitely full of lots of people who, I think, I don't, even, I don't know the per percentage, but I think the, the percentage of people who went to Oxford or Cambridge is really high. Um, and, and the other, m you know, pretty much most of the other people went to quite prestigious universities, if, it, if you know, Durham or uh, a red brick university, as we call them. Um, so people, people like me are quite unusual at the Guardian. Like there are other ones, but, <laughs> but you know, the, you, can, you can kind of count them on one hand, really. Um, and I've, yeah, I've noticed it a bit. You know, you get in, even sometimes you get in conversation with people who are not, you know, you know they're not posh necessarily. But you, you might, you might say, you know, you might get talking, and and, and you know, I've, a couple of times I've mentioned, oh, you know, there aren't that many working class people in this organisation. Um, and someone will, and then the person will be like, "Oh, I know it's terrible. Um, my parents were working class, um, but you know they they worked really hard, and uh, you know could afford for me. You know, like they did well, and they could afford for me to go to private school. Um, and I'm just like, oh, okay. Like my my mum did two jobs like while I was growing up. But I guess maybe she just didn't quite work, work hard, hard enough. enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it feels like I don't know, like a microaggression, like that. You just you don't want to be like that's actually it's quite rude of you to, to say that. <laughs> Um, so you just ha kind of have to go, mm-hmm, mm, yeah. Um, and they don't realise, because I think they're, they're trying to relate to you and they're trying to be like, oh, I'm not posh like those people, but um, it just com yeah, comes across a bit, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. So, um, yeah, yeah. I think that was like my whole journalism experience is encountering journalists and them being like, Oh, I'm not like those guys. <laughs> Every time, and I'm just like, I don't care. It's a very I British do, thing. Yeah, it's very British I just thing. I came to do my job. I'm not, I'm not trying to suss out if you're, you know, if you're classist or racist. I don't, you know, and I have my suspicions, but <laughs> I've just come here to do my job. But I'm faced with that, like literally, I'll pitch a story or I'll say, oh, you know, I grew up in a council flat, and then someone will be like, oh yeah, my grandma did. And I'm just, I, I don't care. <laughs> I really don't care. I really don't. So we were talking a lot there about breaking into this industry that has a lot of closed doors, whether you've got the finances, whether you've got the time, whether you've got the right connections, whether you went to the right school, university. What I want us to move us towards now is talking a little bit about once you are in journalism, how does the lack of representation impact the quality of journalism? How does an industry which is mostly white and privately educated or from these relatively elite backgrounds impact what we do and how we reflect the world around us in our journalism? So. At least in my personal experience, I grew up in a single-parent household in a council house. Uh, we claimed benefits and, you know, did not come... F Basically, now I can open up any newspaper, any sort of red top tabloid newspaper and still to this day read stories about single parent scroungers. So that is a reflection that I still see that has not changed since I was a kid. You guys now working in journalism, working in these newsrooms, have you come up against things where you're like, the lack of representation does negatively impact how we cover particular beat areas, whether that's benefit claimants or whether that's um, uh, people in poverty in the UK. Um, and I know, Jane, you actually had something you want to talk about also related to this around the demise of local journalism and what that means for people covering local beats. So just keen to hear a little bit about your experiences working in those newsrooms and how that negatively impacts things. 
yeah, and I think look, that's the most important point, right? It's 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 um, you know not really about whether people like us can get jobs in journalism. It's about if you do not have a diverse newsroom, are you accurately reflecting and representing the people and the places you cover? And that's ultimately what matters. And um, yeah, I mean, throughout my career, I've definitely noticed exactly the things you would talk about there. Um, uh, one of the big examples that I always spring to mind, you know, benefits is kind of day in, day out. Just colleagues just not understanding how universal credit works, for example, because their sister, their brother isn't on it, and they just read the mail or the sun. Um, and don't really know how it works. But when I was um, a very very young journalist, quite a while ago now, um, and we were covering the London riots, um, there was we'd have these big morning planning meetings, and um, in it uh, we were kind of discussing, all right, who should we interview, what pieces should we do, and basically like all of the all of the interviewees being suggested and all of the reasons. Uh, being said, put forward for why the London riots had happened were basically from, um, you know, white middle class people who were kind of parroting the police, the government's line at the time that this was all about gangs, this was all about criminals. Um, and nobody actually was getting to the gist of what we now know was, you know, the root cause of the London riots. It was, it was social deprivation and it was, um, it was disaffection and it was about poverty and ultimately kind of the, the wealth divide. And it was at these, as they were saying at the time, the police, these black criminal gangs roaming around, just, you know, looting for the sake of it. Um, and I really felt, I think that was the first time in my career on like such an important issue that I really felt that the lack of, you know, working class journalists. We were quite good in terms of um, racial diversity at the BBC at the time, but it, it, not in terms of class. Um, and I felt that was a real gap. And yeah, I started out my career in local journalism, not at papers, at the BBC, but it was still, you know, cash-strapped local journalism. And I feel like the demise or of a lot of local papers, local journalism overall, has just narrowed the roots into journalism and the type of people you attract because there used to be more of a diversity when there were more options in terms of roots into journalism through the local paper, the local broadcast or whatever, you would get people from a more um, vocational background maybe who had NCTJ qualifications rather than a degree. Um, uh, people who like were from different parts of the world that wasn't just London because let's face it, like working as a journalist in London and surviving is really hard and you need a lot of money. And when I started out in journalism, I specifically said, I will go anywhere but not London because I can't afford to stay in London any longer. And I'd started off in Newcastle and it meant I could get by on a 18 grand a year salary. Um, uh, but it did mean that a lot of my like fellow trainees or the people starting out, they wanted to be in London because that's where the big newspapers were, that's where Panorama and Newsnight was. Um, and I just felt that wasn't an option for me to start with. Um, so that local news route just gave me, as a journalist, you know, I didn't have any money. I was, I was you know, getting payday loans to afford the rent on my next place before my deposit came in because my parents couldn't help me out. And... Um, it made it a bit more affordable to be a journalist by going through Birmingham, Newcastle, etc., before ending up in London. And it really concerns me that, you know, the collapse of um, certain papers, um, local news generally, is just really narrowing the type of people who can afford to be journalists today. I think my experience of seeing how class affects reporting was during... Uh, the what was that disaster? I completely forgot the name. Grenfell, yeah. Um, that was literally the most. It was like the most glaringly obvious thing in my eyes. I was like, why? Is, why have we got like two reporters working on this rather than the whole team? Everybody, we sh it should be like like a massive thing. Everyone, it should be serious. It should be like something that should be top of the agenda. And I think that was like really glaringly obvious. And then it got like scarily obvious because it was like the way the people who were picked to report on it, it would be like the Muslim reporter and the black reporter. <laughs> and it's like, that's wrong on so many levels. It's so wrong. Um, and then also being in a newsroom as a black reporter, who's also from a working class background, it's like, you can't even be working class because when you're pitching stories, they're thinking like, move man, like we want you to talk about the black stuff. Like <laughs> they don't even want you, they can't even fathom that, oh yeah, she is, she has grown up in an estate or she has grown up here. 
there's not a chance for people to kind of think of you with the duality of that, which is quite difficult. Um, but with um, being someone who can commission articles, I make sure that, okay, it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't even check people's education. I don't even know how people have gotten that shallow. I can't, I'm, I'll be honest, how people are like, you know, even when I'm having conversations with people and they're like, oh, what uni did you go to? I'm like, why do you care? Like, what, what when I, if I say to you that I didn't go to uni, what's, what are you going to say now? Oh, oh, oh well, that's, that's a shame. What, what are you going to say? Like, when people say stuff like, oh, yeah, I, I, I went to City and I got NCTJ, rah, 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 rah. I'm just like, I, I got NCTJ and like, I'm not going to say it doesn't mean, no, do you know what? If you want to do news and like serious news, like what Jane and these guys are doing, you know, yeah, I suppose, like, you know, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure, you know, you do your shorthand, etc. But, like, um, no, do you know what I mean? You could just use Otter and it's really great. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I think the, the, the classism and, like, how people make you feel and that, it's just, like, when, when I commission people, I don't care. Like, if you, even if you don't have a byline, I'll take a chance on you. If it's crap, then we'll work on it together. And that's what, that's what, that's what I think an editor should be doing. They should be nurturing a journalist to empower their work rather than being, like, rah, 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 that's, that's how I feel anyways. Well, it was very apparent in Grenfell, right, with the journalists that did yeah. then go to the scene, there was a total lack of trust within those communities mm -hmm. because of the relationship that they've yeah. built and their understanding of how journalism works. There definitely. was a big barrier. They didn't want to speak to the journalists there, right? Mm -hmm. So that was something. Most definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I think for me, the, the kind of main thing is like how working class people as a group are kind of perceived um, in the media. So um, I've noticed like, especially after like the Brexit vote and things like that, there was like this notion that like working class people are uh, ignorant, bigoted, um, stu yeah, stupid, um, and, that, and, and that working class people caused Brexit, or, you know, like, in our last general election, um, where the Conservative Party got, got back in, um, you know, there was a perception, especially in the North of England, that, um, or about the North of England, that um, working class people had caused that to happen. And it infuriates me because you get you get actually some very intelligent people, like very intelligent journalists and editors, who genuinely believe that working class people are more bigoted. You know, they're more racist and more homophobic. When all the research that's ever been done shows that actually working class people are less bigoted than middle class people, so tend to be less homophobic, tend to be less racist. Um, and I don't know why that is. I think there's different theories about because uh, we often live in mixed communities. You know, um, we've got often enough on our plate to be worrying about like then whether like someone's gay or not you know <laughs> um and it's and but, but yeah people are really surprised when you tell them when you tell them that because the the narrative in the media so much is just that you know if you if you ask people on the street most people would say middle class people and posh people are less bigoted than working class people but it is literally the opposite of that um, and I think what happens is, you, yeah, you get editors with those views that just kind of push that narrative all the time. So, you know, going to certain town, you know, they'll pick certain towns to cover things and they, they, they know what line they want. You know, around Brexit, there was like a lot of, um, I don't know, them, them wanting someone to show up and, and, you know, like to ask people on the street and they want people to say, oh, I'm voting Brexit because I don't want any more Muslims in, in this country or, you know. And if you're, if you're from the newspaper that has that idea, if you talk to enough people in a town, eventually you'll find a person who says that. Um, yeah, and, I, and it's just kind of a self-perpetuating thing and it's really hard to break now. Um, and I don't, I don't know how we'd, we'd go about it, but that's, that's kind of like the main frustration for me. Mm. And then like the smaller things, you know, a few times I've pitched stories that I know would work really well and the editors don't really understand why they, you know, like, uh, you know, a few times I've been like, there was one, one example. I want, uh, before Christmas, I wanted to go to, um, there's a, ta a city called Bradford, really, really near where I grew up. Um, and it's hugely deprived. It's always been really deprived, but now it is something else. Like it is, people are just so poor. Um, and it just doesn't get covered. Um, and I pitched an idea to an editor that was um, to go to a, uh, like a cash converters, like a pawn shop, um, to speak to people going in and out before Christmas and see what they're pawning or what they're selling 
because it'll be things like, you know, it might be like their baby's push chair that they actually need, but they, they're trying to buy Christmas presents. And I remember pitching this to an editor, and I was like, and I was like, this is, I've nailed this, this is a great idea. Um, and it's really important. Um, and I was like, I'll take a photographer, and, and the editor was like, oh, well, I can't really see it coming off, you know, I, can't, I don't really think, it's, you know, I don't really think it'll be that bad. And I was like, no, it, it is that bad, it is that bad. And he was like, mm, yeah, well, it just, it just seems to me like you might end up wasting, wasting your day. And then I couldn't do it because the editor didn't understand. And I was like, if he was here seeing it with his own eyes, mm. he'd know easily. You know, I could get it. I could get it done in an hour and then have the rest of the day off. Like that's how <laughs> <laughs> that's how bad it, it is. But um, yeah, so mm. that's a bit of a frustration um, as well. Yeah, uh, we touched on this a little bit f through what you guys were just saying around the intersection between gender and race with class. Um, and as I mentioned at the start, while some areas of diversity are improving in journalism, like gender, as we said, class is still something that's not. Um, I would love to just hear any additional thoughts you guys have around the intersection of uh, gender and race with class, but also whether you feel like that's something particularly unique to the UK. We can open up to Q&A at the end to hear other people's newsrooms elsewhere, but whether you think that's something, yeah, particularly unique to the UK or something that um, uh, you had any comments on that you want to share now. Well, the intersection of both uh, is hell. <laughs> it's a very, very hellish experience. Uh, and it's the reason why I'm not a full-time journalist, like work in a newsroom. I could never do it again, so absolutely not. No, I can't believe I'm <laughs> saying that at this festival, but I have to be honest. Um, as a black woman in a newsroom, it's absolutely hell. Um, if you see a black person, if you work in a newsroom with a black person, you just don't, don't assume they're having a good time, they're not having a good time. Um, you laugh, but they're not having a good time because um, the, the racism in the UK is just it's too much. Um, and yeah, like how do I explain it? Um, it's like you're being called your colleague's name. You're the only black person there. There's freelancers. You're getting called their names. The racism is like you can't even explain it to people because they think you're going crazy. But during the um, George Floyd stuff. I had so many journalists from my career being like, I'm so sorry, I was racist to you, and you just feel like, oh, so I didn't make it up. Mm. But yeah. And is this something that you think is particularly unique to the UK, this issue of class? Is this something, Jane, you work for an international newsroom, is this something New York Times ever explores or come across the same sort of conversations? I mean, I'm not going to sit here and bullshit anyone that class is not an issue in um, the US. Um, I work for the New York Times. Um, uh, traditionally, in the past, there's been, you know, kind of like we have here Ox uh, a big kind of cohort from Oxbridge. Obviously, there's been a lot from Harvard, Columbia. That's kind of the insiders club over there. Um, I would say that, look, I think class is a bigger issue in the UK because, um, and this is exactly the type of broad generalisation that our, my press manager told me not to say, but I think it's true anyway. Um, look, we're a, we're a small nepotistic island, like we're just smaller, so the feeder schools um, they're, they're, they're less diverse, there's fewer of them, so you just end up with a cosier network. Like, the US is so big that, yes, you have the Harvards, the Columbias, but it, it's big enough that it doesn't end up, that power is just focused on, it's coming from a very small, specific group of people like we have here with Eton and Oxbridge and all the rest. So I think just because of the nature of how small of a country we are, um, the fact that so many people in journalism went to Oxbridge and Eton and stuff, you end up with editors who all know each other, journalists who all know each other, who hire their mates because they know them and they think they're good. Um, so I do think, in my experience, like we have more of an issue in the UK than, than elsewhere, but it's definitely not unique to the UK. But I found, like, look, before the New York Times, I worked at BuzzFeed. Um, before that, I worked for uh, UK newsrooms, was the BBC mostly. And I was trying to, like, when I left the BBC and went freelance, I was trying to get jobs at kind of British newspapers, at British broadcasters. And it was only when I was interviewing, like, with Americans, um, like BuzzFeed at the time and later on the New York Times, it was the only place where editors didn't ask me what school I bloody went to. Like, nobody cared. And partly it's because of the lack of cultural knowledge. Like, they don't know anything about Hull, really, other than it's Brexit town. <laughs> um, uh, so there's not that recognition there. But no one's cared that I don't have a degree in the US. No one's cared what school I went to, whereas 
in the UK, I mean, they, they get it when you say you're from Hull. They get it when you don't have a degree. Um, and I feel like the, at least in my experience, been more of an obsession in the UK and similar with an accent, right? They just hear a British accent and they're like, oh, you're all posh like the Queen. They don't pick up that my accent is actually from like a northern working class town. So I feel like my class is kind of hidden more in the US um, uh, when I'm speaking to Americans um, and that kind of is a bit protective um, in a way. Um, but, uh, but yeah, long story short, it's an issue elsewhere, but I do think it's a particularly bad issue in the UK. But I'd be really curious on other people's experiences. Yeah, that, it's really interesting because I uh, recently did the Reuters Institute Fellowship, um, so last year from January to July, um, and it's, uh, if you don't know what it is, it's just um, a research program where you go and you research a topic that, uh, about journalism that you're particularly interested in, um, and it's people from all around the world, so I was the only person from the UK on my, um, on my fellowship. Um, and it, it was the first time I'd ever, like, experienced um, some time with, like, no classism because they didn't understand the British class system. I actually tried to explain so many times in so many different ways. I was like, okay, so we've got, like, the landed gentry and they, you know, they, they're, they're, they have titles and sometimes that means that they can go in the House of Lords and, and, and like, to help dictate the laws. And they're like, wait, what people... Are People were born into like a government, like a government kind of thing. I'm like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, that is weird. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, trying to explain like class signifiers, like saying, you know, oh, working class people. Okay, so they sound, you know, we sound like this. We we dress like this, you know, like, um, and tr just trying to explain all that stuff. And it and it and it was absolutely crazy. And I don't think I ever got them to actually understand how to recognize the difference between a working class person and a middle class person um, and a posh person. But I did get them at least to understand that like it's, it is actually a big deal in this, <laughs> in this country. Mm. And um, yeah, so I think, it, and that was, but it was just like a really interesting kind of experience and like talking to, obviously other countries have similar challenges in, in different ways, but like no, nobody seemed to have like a, such a kind of nebulous, thing with just like such small, I mean, I think part of the reason that we've all got on, got on quite well in journalism is that we, we have like polish, you know, like we, we can, we can pass in, in different, you know, all of us. I think if I met any of you guys and didn't know who you were or anything like that, I'm not sure I would definitely know by looking at you that you were working class. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's the reason that we're probably sitting here um, because we, because we can pass much easily much more easily than other people, other working class people. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but that was really that was really nice, just having that six months away from. I mean, but then I was in Oxford, which is yeah, <laughs> really messes with your head. So uh, yeah. Can I can I say one last thing? Yeah. What, one thing that really does shock me is how like middle class and like upper class journalists who like go to like these really um, Oxford universities. You know when you watch TV, yeah, and, and like, let's say, like, the journalist is interviewing, like, a politician, and they're, like, they find the leak because they're at dinner with the brother who's, like, <laughs> the politician's brother. This stuff is real, you know? Like, I remember I said to a journalist, like, how do you find that? He's like, oh, yeah, at Christmas. And I was like, wow, this, this stuff yeah. is really real. Oh. This is mm. very real. I was on a holiday um, in Marrakesh at Christmas, and one of the things, like, my editors just want me to do is, like, try to break into Westminster, like, build up sourcing there, which I've spent most of my career avoiding, to be honest. Um, and I was trying to explain to him, like, I can try, but it's very well covered. Everyone knows each other. It's hard. And I came back and told him the story of my Christmas holiday, just so he would understand how hard it is. He's American. Um, and I was on holiday, just me and my family, normal holiday. And we bumped into um, uh, a very senior political journalist there who was on holiday with his wife, who was the former head of comms for a former prime minister. And they were on holiday there with two spads from Labour and the Tories who were also married to each other. And I'm like, this is why I can't crack into this world. I'm not married I don't, to anyone. I don't go on holiday with anyone. But it just, like, in one example, just highlighted just how... Um, uh, nepotistic um, yeah. and insidery our industry is, and I think lobby journalism in particular yeah. is bad. But it's, it's, on that note. Yeah, no more in the UK to be the godparent of the prime minister's son, <laughs> but also be a political correspondent. So anyway, uh, just just to uh, just looking forward about you know what's being done about this. We've got about ten minutes left, so I want to open up to Q and A. But 
have we seen any positive initiatives in the UK or in newsrooms where they're, they're, they're actively trying to do things? So, for example, I know The Guardian has a Scott Trust bursary. The BBC now in job applications asks, um, you know, what job did your parents do and tries to sort of dig into that a bit more. Have you guys noticed any positive change where things are looking to try and tackle this problem? Yeah, I, I actually just think the fact that we're, we're having this conversation now is something that wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. Like, it's, it's something that, that, as an industry, we are starting to recognise in, in kind of small ways. And like you say, um, there are various schemes. I mean, the problem sometimes is it's all kind of... It all ends up kind of mixed together. So the Scott Trust Bursary, which is a great scheme um, at The Guardian, and it brings people from underrepresented backgrounds into the newsroom... But it still is sometimes, you know, you have to have like one of the things that's underrepresented. So it might be like race or gender or uh, class. Mm -hmm. um, but it still does mean that, that you know, like when they're trying to, when they're trying to get the numbers right, um, class kind of falls by the wayside, I think, sometimes. Mm -hmm. And you don't, we don't actually get that many working class people coming in through that route um, still. Uh, but like, yeah, mm -hmm. I think it is, I, I think at least we're recognising it now where, where historically we, we didn't. Yeah, I mean, I'll just echo very quickly what Robin said. I agree. I think the fact we're having these conversations and acknowledging there's a problem is the first step. And I think there are a lot more schemes that are coming up. We have the fellowship scheme at the New York Times, which is meant to hire you know, more diverse people, the hiring people like me. Um, uh, the BBC trainee scheme has diversified massively over the years. Um, and I do agree with Robin that class often goes by the wayside because often it's an invisible diversity. It's not physical. So it's very easy to put um, you know, a female newsreader on a black newsreader on and be like, look, we're so diverse. But if you go behind the scenes, you're like, okay, who are the people in, char in charge of these people? Who are the managers pulling the strings? And often they're still posh mm. white people. Yeah, I agree with what everyone says. Um, there's also a platform called Creative Access, which are amazing. So yeah, that's yeah. it for me. Um, and just one last thought about that is, you know, newsrooms now doing surveys around gender pay gaps and there's a big push for ethnicity pay gap reports. And I do actually wonder if there should be something in journalism around privately educated or university focused one as well. Um, I'm conscious about time, so I wanna open up to Q&A. We've got five minutes. So um, should we, uh, where should we go? Start at the back and then come, come forward, yep. Oh. Oh, hello. Um, it was really lovely to hear you uh, talking about this because I was nodding in agreement with everything that you said, especially as I'm a freelance journalist, but mostly working at the BBC. But I wanted to, because obviously you mentioned how um, your background basically informs the stories that you're pitching. Um, I was wondering whether you, you experienced the opposite of it, because I have, um, where editors dismiss a London story, so to speak, because it's London-centric, but then there is a real reason that London story is necessary to be told. Um, because they said, well, it's to London, we can't do this, we need to be seen doing more stuff outside. And I have examples where, you know, um, there are outside broadcasts that are done throughout the country, but then there is not actual real journalism done there, it's just really let's put a reporter, let's put a presenter in another BBC studio, but it really doesn't make a difference. It's just that they moved from London to, you know, Bristol or something without actually having... Have, have you experienced that? And is this sort of performative exercise really, does it help move the needle or does it inspire for better journalism? Sorry, does it make sense? I hope so. Yeah, it makes sense. And I was actually at the BBC at the time when they were doing the big move to Salford and there was a lot of it felt like signpost, you know, just just um, uh, kind of for show a little bit because I know the presenters would, you know, present from there, but they would be coming back every night to London. And you can't cover a community properly if you're just coming backwards and forwards. So I think there's definitely an issue there. Um, I do think, though, things like Salford, etc. Th now there are there are more journalists moving out there and reporting on the area um, outside of London a bit better. And personally, in my experience, I don't know. I've never had a story turned down, a pitch turned down for it being too London centric. I feel like there's just so much of an issue the other way that I think anything we can do to move our reporting outside of London actually is helpful but it should be in a meaningful way and not you know just what it looks like and I don't know, Robin you might have some thoughts as 
Yeah, I haven't really, I haven't really seen that, but that, not to say it doesn't happen, because I'm sure it does. Um, I think, I think one thing I've noticed a lot is like the notion of like the North is is just working class. So like sometimes, you know, they'll they'll want to do a story uh, in the North, um, and uh, but then they'll still pick an, a town that's like. Uh, we, you know, we do actually have wealthy towns in the north. So, like, yeah, Harrogate or you know, Richmond. Or, Jacket, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah. So that's that. You know, that's something I, I have noticed a little bit. Cool. And I can have a question. Uh, yeah, at the back. Oh. Two minutes. Okay. Thank you again so much for having this. I just think this is a, such a huge need. And um, my question is around trust, because it seems like. There's all these conversations around trust in media, and you know AI and disinformation and social media, but it seems to me like there might be a very direct connection between the erosion of trust and the statistics you mentioned about the complete erosion of the working class among journalists. And I'm wondering if you see that connection or if I'm just making that up. Any, any thoughts? There's a massive connection there, completely. And I think the example that Vic brought up earlier about Grenfell just highlights it, right? We have this huge erosion of trust in the industry, and partly is because journalists are now, you know, uh, framed as, you know, the elites. Like, they're not like us. They don't get what our lives are like. They don't get where we're coming from. And a big part of that is true. Um, where it allows, you know, enemies of journalism uh, to smear journalists, right, in that way. Whereas if we hired more journalists who are representative of the areas, the people they cover, I think it would massively help trust. Like, even when I was in local news um, a while back now, there was just a lot more trust from people. Whenever there'd be a big story, a big national story, often the locals would talk to us and they'd be like, oh, there's some twat from the BBC News or Newsnight or the Guardian or Daily Mail or something, but we won't talk to them, but, you know, but they, they, they just want their, like, soundbite and then they bugger off, they don't know what it's like, so... I know it's working for both sides, uh, both, both national and local news, sorry. There was definitely more trust locally. And kind of now work for international news, I've now got to work even harder to prove that, you know, it's not just Americans who don't understand what's going on here coming in and preaching to you or telling you what's going on. Um, so, yeah, uh, upshot, yes, massively agree. Would love to take more questions, but I've been told that's the last of the questions. But we are around to obviously continue talking about this. Thank you so much for joining this panel conversation. Sorry, I, didn't, I should have moved to Q&A earlier. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> Oh, fantastic. Uh, yeah, yeah.